he has Macbeth uh, speak in a kind of a mixture of a voiceover and then he'll speak aloud. And what that does is it's very subtle, but when you're watching the film, you realize that when you're watching Macbeth, for instance, later on in the play and he, he, he finds out his wife is dead and he's speaking, we hear the voiceover. It, it sort of melds into him speaking aloud. And you realize that the character Macbeth, who you believe, you you believe watching John Finch play Macbeth. He's so brilliant. He's a th you know he's a theater actor, and you and you watch this, and you believe that he is this character, and that's great. See, this is brilliant casting because if they get Denzel right, for example, and you're watching the the new version, you're going the whole time. You can't help but think this is Denzel. I mean, it's great. It's brilliant. And I love Denzel, but you're always thinking in the back of your mind, this is Denzel Washington. Whereas when you're watching this, you don't know who John Finch is. You know, he's a theater actor, but this is, this was in 1971. We don't really know him from, from films. He didn't become a major film um, star. So you believe that it's Macbeth. And when he starts speaking aloud, where he was speaking um, in his interior, you go, okay, he's, He's losing his grip on reality. Now, Macbeth doesn't go insane uh, in the play. He never he never loses his mind. In fact, he sort of gains his mind. Um, he he totally falls into his role that he wants to fall into, and that's one of the great mysteries in the play. That it's like this idea of has he been given this fate. And this uh, this idea of what his fate is, and now he realizes it and he accomplishes it, or does he take this as like his, it's kind of his motive for doing what he was always going to do. And that's interesting because he's a killer, right? He's a legitimate killer. We know the very first thing we hear about him is how he killed a guy in battle. But obviously there's a difference between him killing in battle as a soldier in defense of his country and his king and murdering uh, a guy in cold blood. And in fact, that's not like speculation. Shakespeare goes into that when he has Macbeth do a monologue about the, the three major reasons why he shouldn't kill Duncan. Of course, he decides to do that anyway. Um, okay, so back to Polanski. So, so we see the guys come up to Duncan, who's the king of Scotland, and he says, and they tell him what happened. And Duncan says, uh, great happiness. You know, he's this old guy and he's a likable. He's a, he has to be likable. He's got a beard. He's a likable King. I'm mirrored in this thing. So I keep getting my hat crooked. Um, uh, uh, so, and he's likable and that makes a difference because he has to be likable because we have to feel for the fact that he dies when Macbeth kills him. Okay. So what happens is then it cuts to, as we discussed last night, Banquo and Macbeth are on the heath and they're riding along. They kind of get out of the, they get out of the rain and they see the three witches. They're greeted by them. And Macbeth becomes wrapped with all, right? He's enraptured by this idea that he could be king. So he began as what's called the Thane of Gloms. Um, that's how it's pronounced. Gloms, G-L-A-M-I-S. Uh, he became, he was the Thane of Gloms. Then he is rewarded with uh, being the Thane of Caldor. A Thane is like a Scottish lord. Then he knows that he will be king. And then remember that when they disappear at, uh, and Banquo says to Macbeth, be basically be careful because he says, the instruments of darkness sometimes uh, win us with honest trifles only to betray us in deepest consequence. This is so true. This is so true of every... Um, temporal thing that you're offered in life, the great, you know, as long as you bow down, you know, or kiss the ring or whatever it is. Um, if you sell your soul, you can have all of these riches, you can have wealth and power. But what Banquo says to him is you'll be betrayed in the end when you need it most. And that's exactly what happens. So, so the two of them are there and then they ride off, they kind of play it off and they're joking with each other. These are just dudes being dudes. And, and Banquo says, um, you know, uh, you know, you, you will be king. And then uh, Macbeth says, ah, oh, you, you, you know, your, your seed will be king. And they laugh about it and they ride off. Next scene is um, the execution of the current uh, Thane of Cawdor. 
And this is a great scene because this is really weird because they cut to a castle and the Thane is like in like leather 70s chaps um, and like with a cod piece. And he's got like a chain around his neck and it's it's like it's like BDSM or something. And he's all they're all standing there and they're watching him. And and the Thane goes up. He's going to be pushed off and hanged. Instead, he jumps off. And then um, the sons say, um, he hath died uh, as one that hath been studied in his death. Nothing in his life became him like believing it. In other words, this guy, he died with honor, right? He, he, um, his whole life seemed to culminate in this one moment where he died with honor. But Duncan uh, chastises them and said that, um, he says, uh, he was a gentleman on, there's nothing, um, uh, there's nothing, basically, there's nothing profound um, to be learned about a person from studying their face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. And that is amazing because, again, as we talked about last night, one of the themes is the idea of appearance versus reality. Um, today, I was thinking about uh, the 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 word person and the word persona. And... In, in Latin, <laughs> the word persona means mask. And this is interesting because this gets into archetypes, right? And it's the idea that the Greeks, especially with their, with their concept of religious ritual being tied in with theater, believed that, um, that we all, what they're saying is that we, yeah, they all, we, we all, um, wear a mask. We, you know, so we all know this, like you, you're one way with your parents, you're another way, like with your girlfriend or whatever, you're not another way at, at your job. And you sort of wear, you put on these metaphorical masks, right? But we also have a, a true self um, in inside of ourselves, which is something that, you know, we don't really show anybody. It's, it's like the voice inside of our head. It's, you know, the voice, the voice that we hear in our own head is different than the one that other people hear. Shakespeare talks about this a lot. He, it's one of his great, you know, themes. He he says it in um, in Julius Caesar. He talks about when when Brutus and um, when Brutus and Cassius are talking at the beginning of the play. Um, Cassius is trying to convince Brutus that they need to form a, a conspiracy together so they can kill. Julius Caesar. And Brutus is like, not really, he's not really in it. Um, and then Cassius at one point says, um, tell me Brutus, uh, do you know your, it's, I think Cassius says it to Brutus, not the other way around, but Cassius says, do you know, do you see yourself? Do you know yourself? And then the other one responds, um, I, you know, basically I can only see myself in a mirror. Uh, we can never see ourselves right in the mirror. We all know about you know, when we're talking about symbolism and mirrors and the mirror is the symbol of the self or the psyche. And when the mirror shatters, it's our mind shattering. Um, but it's interesting in this play because they use this idea in a complete, in a, they go in a different direction. They use it in a Machiavellian sense where, especially Lady Macbeth, you know, is constantly telling Macbeth act one way in public, but be another way um, in reality. And this comes into play when, so she's standing there on the battlements of the castle and she gets the letter from Macbeth and she's thinking, um, she's reading it and she's, she says, uh, the raven is hoarse that croaks. I'm just doing this from memory because um, I don't want to take the time to look at the text. So I'm just going to do it a lot from memory. She says, um, she says, the raven is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. And there, this is so, this is so brilliant because one of the things about Shakespeare is that there are, every word connects with every other word. There, the themes are constantly reconnecting and reappearing. So the raven croaking, right? He's the raven. This is the sound the cro that the raven makes. He's croaking. But the croak is a pun because Duncan coming into the castle is his fatal entrance. He's going to croak, right? He's going to die. Um, and uh, uh, later on, what does he say? He says, um, uh, 
uh, Macbeth gives his monologue and he says, fatal vision, art thou not fatal vision, um, a dagger of the mind, right? So, so Lady Macbeth is already right away intent on getting rid of Duncan. Um, then when Macbeth appears, they have this great scene that Francesca Annis, who is the actress who plays, um, who plays Lady Macbeth is so perfect in this role because what a lot of directors don't get right is first of all, the age, um, they're young enough where they, they have this ambition to fulfill the rest of their lives, but they're all in power, but, and they have like a youthful vitality. Like Macbeth is virile. He's Lady Macbeth is sexy, but like she's gentle. And one of the weird things is Polanski wanted to cast um, Marianne Faithful in the role of Lady Macbeth. Uh, and she, she, I think she tried out for the role, but she couldn't get it because he saw the track marks on her arm and she was still a heroin addict. That doesn't seem like it would be something that would bother Roman Polanski um, at all, really. But it, she couldn't work. You know, it, it, they, I'm sure they wouldn't insure her for the role. And also she just couldn't deliver. So they got Francesca Annis, who gives everything to the role. She's, she really, she, she transforms in this movie from like being, she looks innocent and wayfish and kind of beautiful, but she's sinister and dark and powerful. And then she goes on in the film to completely falling apart, which is the nature of Lady Macbeth. A lot of people compare, you know, powerful women, politicians to Lady Macbeth. But what they get wrong is that a lot of the women that they compare her, that they compare her to, um, or that, yeah, they don't have, a lot of times they don't have like the soft exterior that makes you want to um, care for this person. It's like you look at them and you know, okay, it's a powerful woman um, and she's in charge. But with Lady Macbeth, she's like, she's delicate. And that's the whole point is that she's got this dual nature. So, so Macbeth shows up and they, they have this like love scene sort of like they, you know, they, they're a great couple. They really like, they're the perfect couple for each other. But what is immediately noticeable is the fact that they don't have children and everybody else in the play has children. Banquo has Flance. Duncan has uh, Malcolm and Donald Bain. Um, Macduff has a whole family. There's constant um, references in the play to children and what we, what I get from the play, I never really hear people. I've, I've heard um, Harold Bloom talked about this in, in his analysis. Harold Bloom is, you know, he's the great one as far as Shakespeare, Shakespearean analysis goes, um, in my opinion. Um, but he kind of talks about this is that Lady Macbeth, it's so obvious that she doesn't have a child, that they don't have a child. And this seems to inform their motives. And this... One of the rules in great literature and in great art is to show and not tell. We don't want to be, we don't want to be told. We don't want to be like taught. We it's not didactic. We don't need exposition. Um, there's a little bit of exposition in the play, right? But it serves a purpose. But we don't need exposition of, you know, oh, this is Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, and they don't have a child because of such and such, which is what the uh, Michael Fassbender, um, Marion Cotillard version of the film kind of did. Um, they showed at the beginning their child being buried. And that was dark and it was, you know, it was it was aesthetic. Um, and it kind of informed the the movie. But it was unnecessary because it's the unspoken, um, the, the, uh, the idea that they've lost a child, which is so, which is so poignant because no one ever mentions the fact that they don't have a child. And that's the whole, per that's the whole point that, that it's like, I would imagine that what happened with them is that Lady Macbeth, if not being an outright member of this cult, if not being an outright witch, um, we all know about B-A-B-I-E-S and how that ties into witchcraft and ritual. If you've seen the movie, The Witch, um, from what, like 2014, 2016, that movie explicitly shows that. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really gross. Um, but it's, it's, if we're going to talk about ritual and occult, occult ritual and inversion, you know, they are, that's where they get their energy. That's, that's what it is. And she mentions this uh, specifically in one of the scenes, right? Um, she says, in fact, let me, let me just read you the scene again. Um, she says, um, 
let me read it. Let me find it in this one. She says, uh, find it in my textbook here, an old textbook. She says, um, because oh, okay, here it is. Um, so she's convinced uh, Macbeth to kill Duncan, and um, he he goes through this soliloquy where in Act One, Scene Seven, um, he says. If it were done when tis done, then twere well, it were done quickly. If the assassination, he says, could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. He says, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. In other words, in other words, he's, yeah, Black Philip, exactly. He's saying, he's saying here, if I could get rid of Duncan and fast forward through all the guilt and everything, right? Fast forward through all the, all the repercussions, then it would be great. But I can't do that because we jumped the life to come. And it, this is interesting because he, uh, Shakespeare writes the word assassination here. And this is the first use of the word assassination in English. Assassination is a Arabic word. It comes from um, uh, hashishin. Uh, which is the hashish eaters. These, these, those were the guys that um, the assassins were the, they fought against the zealots, uh, not the zealots, the um, the Templars uh, during the crusades. They would eat hashish um, to get themselves into like a drugged uh, situation when they're fighting and then like go into the spirit, in the spirit world. We're in the spirit world now, asshole. You see the size of that chicken? You see the size of that cocker doodle dude? What movie is that? <laughs> yeah. So, um, Chavez, he Chavez. Also, uh, the bet he says we'd, um, he says the be all and the end all. That's the beginning of the word of the, that's where that phrase comes off from the be all and the end all. Anyway, he gives a few reasons why he doesn't want to kill Duncan. And then when Lady Macbeth comes in, he says, um, where's Duncan? And she says, um, oh, he's, you know, he's eating supper. And then Macbeth says, we're not going to have any more of this business. We're not going to talk about it anymore. It's done. And she is pissed. She's not mad. Like, she's not angry, angry. But she's she's sort of disgusted in a way. And she says to him, um, she says to him, um, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? She says, um, why did you make, basically, why did you make this promise to me that you're going to kill him? And then you, you like wuss out. You're not a man. And she calls, she says, he's not a man. And then Macbeth's response is pretty good. Macbeth, he's, he's, I mean, he said, you got to say he's a Chad. I mean, he says, um, he says, I would, I dare do all that may become a man who dares do more is none. In other words, look, look, lady, I'm a man. Okay, and if oh, I can't do any more than I already do because I'm already a man, which is fair enough. I mean, the dude's the war hero, right? And she says, what beast was then? Um, and then she gives this monologue, which is so is so great in the film. She says, uh, what beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man, nor time, nor place to then adhere, and yet you would make both. In other words, oh, it, you're a beast then, right? You're a beast. You're not a man. You're a beast. And she says, um, she says, if you would do it, yes, you're a man. But if you would do it, you would be so much more the man. And then she says, um, I have, this is really dark. She says, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I sworn, so sworn as you have done to this. So do you get what she's saying there? Um, I, it, It's so dark and it's it's hard to even talk about, but this is Shakespeare. What she's saying here is, if I made a promise to you, okay, and we had a child, and not and and I, Lady Macbeth, was breastfeeding this child, I would rather pluck my nipple from his boneless gums and dash the brains out 
right? She would rather take her B-A-B-Y. Yes, bash the brains out of this baby rather than break a promise to her husband. That's intense. Who says that? Right? And that sort of indicates to me that she did this, that that she she actually did do this because immediately this triggers something in Macbeth and he says, okay, if we should fail, and she says, fail, screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. She goes on in the film to basically, they, they really make it alive in the movie. She, The two of them are talking while Duncan and his guys are in their castle and they're chilling and they're eating dinner. And she says, look, Leave it all to me. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to summarize it. She says, here's what we're going to do. Um, you're going to go in there and entertain Duncan. While you're doing that, I am going to go drug the guards. Okay. And when Duncan goes to sleep, um, we're going to wait a little while. And the guards are going to be totally passed out. And she says, when, when the guards are passed out, this is crazy. She says, um, what can then you and I not do upon them? In other words, like she talking about like when they're, when they're, when they're passed out, something like sexual, they could go in there and have sex on the bodies of these guards or something is crazy. And consider that, remember who's directing this play. I mean, this film, right? This is, this is Polanski and Polanski had just finished, right? He just concluded his whole, he was in the middle of going through with the fact that his wife, Sharon Tate, who was pregnant and all of their friends were murder, murdered by the Manson family. And one of the things that we know Charlie Manson, the family did was they would creepy crawl. They would go into houses and they would crawl around the house and rearrange stuff and then leave as like a mind game. There was gaslighting, right there. It's a mind game. They're gang stalking. And, um, Polanski was even, you know, one of the reasons why there's so much blood in this film, they asked him about like, do you want so much blood in this film? And he said, yes, he wanted more, right? This is, I don't want to, we can't get into, we can't in this, there's just too much to talk about Polanski and his connections with Manson family and all that stuff. But suffice it to say that this film is a weird, weird, close mirror reality of what happened. Right. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so, so what happens is, um, the key, my favorite, this is one of my favorite scenes really in the, in the film is that, um, while Duncan is falling asleep and I'm wanting a cigarette while Duncan is falling asleep. Right. And, um, that the, the castle is settling. Macbeth goes out and he happens to come up, up, up upon um, his best friend, Banquo. And, and Banquo says, who's there? And he says, it is I, you know, it's, it's I, a friend. And he's with his son. And they talk about the stars. They look up at the stars. And um, we know, this is great dramatic irony, because we know that Banquo is, even if you've never read the play, you already get the feeling that Banquo is going to die, right? That he's, he's Macbeth's best friend. But he's going to die. Um, there's no reason why after he kills um, Duncan, why um, he's going to keep him around. But that's for the future. So what happens is um, Lady Macbeth comes down and the guards have been drugged. They're knocked out. They're asleep. And Macbeth walks up very, very quiet. And this is a great scene because the Macbeth in this film, he walks up. And he said, he kind of, he stops and he's like, I can't do this, but it's, it, it's all interior. And he's like, and then we realize it's, it, it's because every movement that he makes is loud. It's echoing. And he says the very uh, stones prate of my whereabouts. The word prate is like onomatopoetic here, right? It's, it's a loud noise. And if you've ever, um, snuck out of your house like when you were a teenager right if you ever snuck out of your house or or worse back into your house you know how like you're trying to get into your house your parents are asleep and every little you know if you especially you've got like a hardwood floor every little noise you make is going to creak 
and echo through the whole house. And you're like, just don't wake up. Right. And that's what happens in this. And this also reminds me of this ties into like what Ted Bundy and some of the serial killers have said about the, when they were asked in some of these interviews about why they killed some of their victims. And I remember in one interview with Ted Bundy, him saying that he, he ended up killing one of his victims because he wanted her to shut up. So in other words, they're let la- they're if they start screaming and they're loud and they do it because the sound is overwhelming. Right. And so that's their final, that's their final sort of break. And that's exactly what happens in this, right? He, he wants, he wants it quiet. He goes in and all of the action in the play takes place um, off, off stage, but, it, but with the film version, we can see it. He sneaks in and this is a close mirror of the Manson family. He sees Duncan asleep in his bed. He goes up to him and we see Duncan's moment of recognition where he realizes and he says, Macbeth, you know, he looks up and it's Macbeth and he sticks a knife right in his throat and he stabs him. And when you watch it now, you're like, oh man, this is, you, you, you can't help but like, oh, this is 1971. It looks kind of, it looks, it's kind of staged and cheesy. But then there's a moment where Duncan's like dead and then he gives him the coup de grace and he stabs him again. And it's really just the crown falls on the ground, the obvious symbolism, right? But then Macbeth goes down. Lady Macbeth is down there. She, who, who, what? She hears the screech owl. They talk about it. And then uh, she, he says, where, you know, she says, where are the murder weapons? He brought the daggers down with it like an idiot. He he was so wrapped up in killing Duncan that he brought the daggers from the guards downstairs with him. And she goes, why did you bring the daggers down here, moron? Because now, what do they have to do, right? She's got to, she, she says, go back up there and put the daggers back on the guards. And he's like, I, I'm not going to do it. I already killed the guy. I'm not going to do it. So she says, in firm of purpose, she goes up there and she does it herself. And this really is the moment where we know that she snaps because she takes the, she takes, there's this great scene where she takes the daggers and she's looking at him and, and her eyes react because now, you know, um, she's caught red handed, right? She's got blood. She's got physical blood on her hands. She's brave about it, right? She goes up, she places the daggers. Macbeth says this great thing about, Will all great Neptune's ocean wash uh, uh, this blood clean from my hands? No, it will the multitudinous seas in Carnadine, making the green one red. In other words, I can't ever wash the blood clean from my hands because there's so much blood on my hands now that it will redden the ocean rather than washing the red off of my hands. Um, she tells him it's like a painted, she says it's like a painted devil, she says. Um, just go wash your hands, forget about it. So anyway, um, after this happens, um, the next day, this is very, it's not, it's clever. What happens is um, the next day, they wake up, the castle wakes up, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are still awake. Macbeth actually says um, that he's, mur- he says, Macbeth hath murdered sleep. Uh, sleep that r- knits up the raveled sleeve of care, uh, calm nature's balm. Um, Macbeth shall sleep no more. So we know that he's never going to sleep again. He's going to live completely at night. He's a creature of the night. He's a night crawler, right? And um, and so what happens is uh, the next morning, Macduff comes to the castle. He goes in. He wakes up um, Duncan, but Duncan's dead. And he says, "Alarm! Ring the alarm!" Macduff's two sons, or sorry, Duncan's two sons come out. They're immediately under suspicion because. He had just made Malcolm, his eldest son, his heir. So that means if Duncan's dead, Malcolm will be king. But what happens is Macbeth goes in to see the murder scene. The two guards wake up and he kills them right away. And then later Macduff says, why'd you kill kill the two guards? Why'd you do that? And he says, look, man, basically, look, man. when, when, When I see my king dead right there and I see these two guys covered in blood and they got, they're drunk, they're covered in blood, they got daggers with them. Of course I'm going to kill him. And everybody's like, yeah, it makes sense. But it's still a little suspicious, right? Because it's like, uh, did you just get rid of the 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 possible witnesses or did you get rid of the, the killers, right? So so Malcolm and Donald Bain take off. They take off to France, I think. No, Ireland and, and France. And um, they do that to split their fortunes so that they can come back and invade because they know Macbeth did it. 
Macbeth being the third in, or the second in line, right? It goes Duncan, Malcolm, and then Macbeth is immediately crowned at Schoon, right? The Stone of Schoon um, or the Stone of Schoon. Um, and they pronounce it Schoon in the film. And uh, he's immediately crowned. He's made king. Um, interesting thing about the stone, by the way. Do you know? Do you guys know anything about that stone? The Stone of Scone or the Stone of Scone, the Stone of Destiny is an ancient Scottish, it's a stone. Basically, all of the ancient Scottish kings were crowned on top of this stone for, I don't know, hundreds of years until um, Edward Longshanks, um, in one of his invasions, uh, stole the Stone of Destiny and he brought it back to England. And as a sign of... <laughs> I guess disrespect, he put it under the seat of the English throne and it sat there for what, 600 years. It was only, it was only given back when the Scottish parliament devolved a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and they, and they demanded the stone back. So the English still had this thing after 600 years. Right. Um, <laughs> which is crazy. Okay. So anyway, uh, so what happens next is, <laughs> Let's see. We get um, we get uh, oh, Bank uh, Macbeth in. Let's see. We're kind of skipping now to Act Three, and uh, Macbeth's like, "All right, look, um, I'm in power, right? I'm the king, but I've got to. Um, I got to hold on to my power. So, what's the next thing he's got to do to hold on to his power? Where well, he starts thinking, and he's like, he's like, um, well, remember when I was with Banquo? And we saw the witches. He's the one who greeted them first. And they told him that his sons would be king. And that means that I'm king now. But if I go, then Flance is going to be king. There's no way he's going to, there's no way I'm going to let that happen. So he calls in these two assassins. Um, and he, and he tells them, uh, look, he says, look, I'll, although I could with bare face power, sweep them from my sight. Um, I can't, do that because I rely on the Thanes and the other Lords. And if they know that I just kill my best friend, nobody's going to support me. So, um, so he has the two assassins go off and kill Banquo. Right. And then at the end, he's like, Oh, by the way, um, when you're killing Banquo, his son Flans is going to be there. So um, yeah, just go ahead and get rid of him too. And they're like, Oh, okay. So then what happens is um, in the film, we see Banquo, he's going along with his son. They're in the woods. They're they're hanging out. And these two, these two creeps appear out of nowhere. And Banquo immediately knows that these guys are assassins. And he says, fly, Flans, fly. He gets an axe in his back. And it's really grotesque in the film. Uh, I mean, look, you, you know, when you're watching a Polanski film, it's like there's something off, right? It, it's... There's this, I mean, the first time I saw this film, um, I was in 10th grade and I remember uh, just being like, there's just something creepy and off about it. Part of it is the musical score. Um, it's this low, uh, not a hurdy-gurdy, it's this low, um, what's the instrument? It's this low, like grinding, like organ sounds that plays throughout it. Like, and then that combined with some of the the way that it looks, I mean, the, the film is really brilliant, the way that it looks. It's shot so well. It's so beautiful in its, in its darkness. And when you when Banquo gets this axe in his back, it's so shocking because you're watching a film in 1971, and you don't ever see that combined with what we know about real life. And it, the sound that he makes is, Ugh! and he falls like flat into the stream. And then, um, and then, uh, let's see. And then what happens is um, Flance gets away. And we know that that has to happen because, because later on, um, well, the witches already said that the sons of Banquo will be king. So we know that his son Flance has to live because he's going to go on and he's going to give birth to a line of kings that will stretch out to the crack of doom. And that James himself, King James, is going to be um, the inheritor of the throne, right? He's going to end up as the king. Um, so... When they come back, when they come back from killing uh, Banquo, Macbeth like makes this joke and he's, he says, what did you do? And they say, we cut his throat. And Macbeth says, thou art the best of the cutthroats. It's this weird, like, 
this weird, like dark humor he's got. And he, it's, I don't know. So, so then what he does is he says, um, he says, all right, I got to go off to the party. And the Chamberlain says, come on with me and we'll pay you basically. And the two guys, they go with him. And then you, you know, what do you think is going to happen to these guys? Right. Um, he opens up a door. They look down. It's darkness. It's a hole. And they just kick the two guys down in there and tie up the loose ends. Right. Um, and so he's, so, so the two murderers, the two assassins are gone. Um, then what happens essentially is um, Macbeth is his next, the object of his next thing is he knows that um, that the, the next guy that's got to go. Well, f- okay. So first, first what he does is he's like, I don't know what to do. So he goes off and who does he go see again? He sees the witches. Now this scene, this scene is absolutely crazy. Okay. Because I can't think of a, you know, when we talk about um, certain elements confirm, right? Uh, this scene really does it. it. It's, we've got a guy who's an elite. He's in power, right? And how's he going to keep his power? He goes off and he does a ritual with actual occult, uh, with, with, actual, with a coven. He goes, finds the witches, and he finds him at night. He walks in, and what is he? This scene is really disturbing. What does he see? He doesn't see three witches. He sees an entire coven of naked, grotesque women, um, all gnarled and medieval witch-looking, all nude, um, and they've got a big cauldron, and they go through the scene, you know, double, double, toilet, trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. The things that they, the ingredients that they put into it, this is the scene that people say Shakespeare took from an actual um, occult ritual, that he took this from an actual witch's Sabbath, because the things that they put into the cauldron uh, to to boil and bubble that Macbeth is going to drink, drink are all charms. They're all invested with magical powers. They have, um, they have human body parts. They've got uh, baby parts. They've got um, the ninth dead uh, piglet de- uh, that was killed in the moonlight. They've got um, eye of mute and toe of frog, the tongue of the dog. They've got all this different stuff. And at the end, um, the thing that thing that um, that is most disturbing, I think, at the end of it is. Let me find this line here. Um. They say, let's see, this is in Act 4. Um, oh, okay, all right, so this is Act 4, Scene 1. And what happens is, Macbeth, oh, when he comes in, he says, How now, you secret black and midnight hags? And they say, he says, what is it you do? And they say, a deed without a name. Right. They don't want to name what they're doing. Right. Because it's too powerful. He says, I conjure you that by which you profess. However, you come to know it, answer me. And then they say, he said, remember, he commands them to speak. Right. And then the, the witches say, the three witches. So we have three witches, which is obviously an inversion of the Trinity. Right. They're speaking in iambic or sorry, trochaic. Um, they're speaking in a trochaic rhythm, which is the opposite of the normal uh, rhythm of speech, um, iambic. And they say, um, they say, speak, demand, will answer. Say if thou hadst rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters, right? From our, from their master. Okay, who's their master, right? Macbeth says, call him, let me see him. He wants to see the visions. Um. What happens is they 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 finish the charm and the thing that they that they oh
Okay, we back. Can you guys see me? Tell me if we're back or not. All right, good. Sorry about that, you guys. Totally crashed. <laughs> Boomer tech. Um, so what I was saying was, um, oh, what up, Mixki? Sweet dreams of rhythm and passion. Sweet dreams of rhythm through the night. I'm totally hoarse. I've been talking all day. Um, oh, you like my bookshelf? That's one of my, I got another library in the other room. Um, that, that's all poems. That's all history. Um, uh, got a good couple of good books. Hold on. Let me get these out for you guys. Um, If you're interested in Shakespeare at all, um, I got a bunch of Shakespeare here, but I'd say the best, um, some of the best things on Macbeth, if you're interested, if you're watching this and you're interested at all, uh, before I get back to what we were talking about, which was the ritual scene, um, the best I would say when talking about Shakespeare would be Harold Bloom. Um, Harold Bloom, you may disagree with this, but Harold Bloom, who died not too long ago, um, was the, uh, the, the chair, not the chair of the English department at Yale, but he's like sort of the, like Leviathan of American literature. And, um, he wrote Shakespeare and the invention of the human in like 1998, which, um, was like a big, a big deal for me, uh, back then. Um, and I actually... <laughs> Harold Bloom is really interesting. I mean, he's this big, he's this big guy. He looks like, uh, what's that character's name in um, The Phantom Menace? Where, do you remember in The Phantom Menace where they like go and the guy is like, he's played by Brian Blessed and he's like a frog creature. He's like the frog king. Um, And he's like, me, something, dog. So that's, that's what Harold Bloom looks like uh, or looked like. And I know that because um, I actually, met him one time I went to when I lived in New York I went to a poetry reading by this this lady Audrey and Rich and um it was at the 92nd Street Y or whatever and uh and I sat next to Harold Bloom of all people in the audience and he's like this massive globulous and like he was so disenchanted with he hated Audrey and Rich, I, I think. I mean, I wasn't a big fan of her either, but I went to see this, this poetry reading. And um, he like he was like, oh, uh, mm, mm, uh, making all these noises the whole time. And then like his stomach was like gurgling and rumbling. And then he got up at the end and he just got stormed out. He hated mediocrity and he hated, um, he hated low IQ um, morons and he hated... Um, yeah, mediocrity. So I can I I assume that he was not a fan of the reading. Anyway, Harold Bloom writes about Shakespeare uh, better than um, I don't know more in in a much more in depth in a way that um, I've learned a lot. I mean, he he knows he has an encyclopedic knowledge of Shakespeare. Um, and then another great book is. This one, which is called, you guys are going to love this. It's called Witches and Jesuits. <laughs> um, and it's a book about the, it's about the occult um, uh, origins of, of Macbeth. Another great one on Shakespeare is um, Ted Hughes' Shakespeare uh, and the Goddess of Complete Being. Ted Hughes was the poet laureate and kind of an unusual writer about Shakespeare, but again, he's kind of like Harold Bloom that he has an encyclopedic knowledge of, of Shakespeare. And I think that just one more thing, um, the, the thing about uh, Shakespeare is that a lot of people get hung up on Shakespeare and that's, that's, that's okay. Um, because I would, people, I, I don't know, I was about to say it's not for everyone, but it is for everyone. But 
people will say, I don't, I don't like old English. I don't like old English, but Shakespeare isn't old English. Um, Beowulf is old English. Chaucer is middle English. Shakespeare is modern English. Um, and even though it may seem archaic to us, a huge portion of, of the English language comes from Shakespeare himself. He created an in, just astronomical number of neologisms and expressions that we still use to this day. He created the word punk. Did you know that? Um, and the, the, the way that he writes is on purpose. He writes like that purposefully, not only because it was the style of the day, but because, um, the, you know, if we're going to talk about what poetry is and the definition of poetry, poetry, poetry and literature, poetry is not um, a mystery to be solved. It's not a riddle. Uh, when you're, when you're reading great works of literature, you don't read them because you want to be taught lessons. They're not, it's not, um, you know, Aesop's fables. You're not like learning, you know, the morality tale um, from a work of literature. You're, you're gleaning insights about human nature and about the meaning of the universe, the way things are, at least according to the speaker in the particular work. And that doesn't mean you agree with it. It just means that is a vision or a mirror into the world, right? And this is like when you were in school and people would say like, they'd ask you like, what is poetry? And the teacher, the students and the teacher would always say stuff like, poetry is like feelings, man. It's like, you know, expression. It's like self-expression. It's not, it's not those things. Um, poetry is, according to uh, Coleridge, the best words in the best order, okay? Words written in lines. That's all it is. Um, William Carlos Williams, the American poet, said that um, poems are not made of ideas, beautiful ideas. They're made of words. So just like, uh, you know, a, a, an engine is made of, a, you know, a carburetor or whatever. And there's, you know, just like in, a, in, any, in any factory, there's like gears and combines and tubes and pipes. Um, poetry is made of words, uh, uh, punctuation. And speech. That's all it is. Um, yeah. Poetry is like what the emo goth kids write in the back of their notebooks about their exes, man. It's about, she hurt me so bad, man. Um, but yeah, so, so when we're reading Shakespeare, we're reading the best words in the best order. Every line of verse is meant to be a universe unto itself. So that's why there's a line break. You never know what's going to happen in the next line. So he doesn't write prose unless he's writing the language of the low. That's why, that's why the low characters, like the porter in this, the drunken porter who talks about how alcohol affects his libido, speaks in prose because it's the language of the common. When you talk about the princes, the kings, the great, the nobles, the whoever in the poems, I mean in the in the plays, you're talking about the the high people in society or in terms of the hierarchy, because they're speaking directly the best words in the best order this is language diluted so we that's why shakespeare continues to live now because we don't have you know uh little bits of like emotional things there are things that are said that can't ever be said better all right let's get back to the play um let's, let's kind of try to um get into this to tie it up and I, again i i should be talking about the polanski version a lot more um but the reason I'm kind of just going to the text is because the film is so true um, to the text. And I could contrast it with a, a few of the other versions. Um, Jerry brought up the, uh, the um, Orson Welles version to me earlier. And that's a great version. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I think that was the, that was the one that was on. No, that was Othello that was unfinished. Orson Welles is great. And he's got obviously the com uh, command of the English language and of Shakespeare that, is sort of non period, right? But um, but this version is good because it's not just one guy, right? I mean, Wells dominates. This is a true ensemble artistic piece, and all of the all of the shots, all of the the mood and the tone of the movie really complement um, what Shakespeare's purpose here, which is the fact. I mean, again, it's not so we can 
learn a moral from this play. But what we're getting here is an insight into truth. And the truth is that, um, you know, you know, what is the what is the truth of this play? What what is it? What is who is Macbeth? Right? What does he do? Um, he starts off. He's a regular guy. He's not a regular guy. He's a war hero. He rises to power with the help of the people that we mentioned. He does rituals to stay in power, and at the end, he is dominated by said power to which he sold himself. So. How could this not be any clearer, right? Um, at the end of the ritual, um, oh, okay. So, 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 what he learns um, from the witches, and this is amazing in the film. So, what happens in the in the play is he demands an answer to what's going to happen to him, right? And he sees a number of visions. Uh, and this is, I mean, you know, all of our friends have talked about this stuff before, right? I mean, imagine, you know, Jerry's talked about this. Tristan's talked about, shout out, uh, try, shout out to Tristana, Primal Edge Health, has talked about this before. You get these people who go down to South America. They, they um, you know, indulge in, in these, in, you know, ayahuasca and DMT, and they want to have rituals and insights into the future and into their, into their lives and they are presented with things that are so disturbing that their minds break, that their minds shatter, right? Because they're contacting Macbeth is specifically contacting demons in this play, in this play. Right. And he's presented with an image of um, a child. Right. And he's told beware Macduff, beware Macduff. Right. Um, and that means be aware of the last dude that could destroy you. Cause McDuff is kind of his equal, right? And then he's told, um, that, um, Macbeth will rule until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. And again, this is like, this is the ritual. I mean, this is the, uh, I'm sorry, the riddle because Macbeth is like, listen, who can unfix the, the earthbound root? Who can get, make a forest rise up and come to me, right? Well, uh, we'll see later on that, dumbass, it's not the forest that's walking. The people are just using um, camouflage. They cut down the tree from Burnham Wood, and they're going to come, and they're going to invade, right? And then he's told that – this is the one we sort of all remember. He's told that um, no one of woman born – shall harm Macbeth, right? No one of woman born shall harm Macbeth. So if you're Macbeth, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? It means, look, man, nobody can kill me because everybody's got a mother. You got to have a mother. You, you can't be a human being and not have a mother. Well, Polanski does some interesting things in this scene. If you watch it, um, he superimposes and he does some subliminal imagery in this, which is he shows us a severed head. He shows us Macbeth's own severed head. And then he shows us an image of a cesarean section. Um, we can obviously see, we, we know being grown people that this is going to mean, we don't put it together when, when seeing or reading the play or watching it for the first time. But later on, Macduff is going to say to him, he's going to say to him, um, despair thy charm. I was from my, my mother's womb untimely ripped, which means uh, that when Macduff was born, his mother died immediately before his death. They gave her a C-section and they ripped the baby from the womb and he lived. So technically he was not born. He wasn't born the natural way he was ripped and also his mother was dead so despair the of thy charm right he is he's the nemesis he's Macbeth's nemesis but he doesn't put that together now when you watch the film there's a, this there's the, the scene that comes next because what happens is Macbeth says I demand to know one thing more and the witches tell him seek to know no more and he says, if you don't show me an, an eternal curse fall upon your head, 
Macbeth, Shakespeare, what he does is he echoes the same thing through Macbeth that the ancient playwrights would do, which is throughout Oedipus Rex is constantly cursing um, people throughout the play for not telling him things or not not um, going through with his with his wishes. And he doesn't realize that every time he does that, he's cursing himself because he himself is the cause of the plague and thieves. Macbeth does the same thing here. He doesn't realize that he's cursing himself. And he says, basically, show me the image of Banquo's sons. And what he sees here is, and this is so, this is so, you talk about esoteric and occult imagery. We see Banquo on a throne. And he's holding a mirror. And Macbeth says, the crown does sear mine eyeballs. That's the first use of the word eyeballs in English. The light is shining off of the crown and it blinds Macbeth. And the mirror obviously symbolizes the fact that, first of all, he's looking into the, the seeds of time, as we talked about earlier. He's looking into the mirror, seeing his future, but he's also looking into himself because he knows the truth, right? He knows that he will not be king. He's going to die. He knows Macbeth, that Banquo's family will stretch out. The line will stretch out to the crack of doom. Later on, see what he sees is the mirror reflects another person and that reflects another person that reflects another king that reflects another king until eventually the mirror is shattered. So we all know what this means. This is the archetypal mirror shattering is the, his mind shattering, his psyche is shattering. Yes. And it's, it would be interesting to see an analysis, a full analysis of Macbeth and his character as a sort of DID um, DID serial killer, right? We all know the history with that. And I think that his continuous trauma in the play or, or leading up to the play, his war service, his baby, what we talked about before that, his wife, what about in his early life, all of these things. And we see that his, he himself, his mind is split. And actually the Denzel version does a great, does a great sort of play on this because when he's walking towards the Duncan's room at the beginning and he says, um, art thou not the dagger of the mind, right? Um, the, and he talks about the air drawn dagger. Is this a dagger that I see before me, which, which marshals me the, the way that I was going? Basically he imagines a dagger right? He, he imagines a dagger. Um, he imagines a dagger in his mind. Yes. And he says, he sees a dagger floating that way. Right. And then he sees, Oh, the dagger. You mean just like the one that I happen to have in my hand here. And then that leads him the way to, that leads him the way to, to Duncan. And now he's got a dagger in his hand and then he uses it. It's like he, He's two different characters. He doesn't know that he himself is doing this. It's he, he disassociates. He wakes up at the end of this. The witches are gone. The ceremony is over. He immediately decides to, um, to kill uh, Duncan, to have Duncan, I mean, not Duncan, McDuff's uh, whole family um, slaughtered. Um, and uh, because he orders his guys to go in and slaughter, this whole family it's it's crazy um and then what happens is um in act five just kind of i'm skipping a bunch but i you know i'm just i'm kind of skipping a bunch but i'm trying to get to the heart of the matter here that who else his mind has been shattered but lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth is wandering around the castle. She's sleepwalking. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth never are alive, uh, awake during the day anymore. They live at night. And she's wandering around. She's sleepwalking. And she's giving away the secrets to what happened. And the doctor and the nurse are like, whoa, I didn't hear that. Um, because Lady Macbeth says, who would have thought he would have had so much blood in him? Right? She's obviously talking about how the fact, the fact that they murdered Duncan and they're like, whoa, we, we didn't hear this. Right. <clears throat> and then what happens is um, they come to invade uh, the castle. Everybody's turned against Macbeth. He doesn't care. He's now completely, he's willing to fight. 
Um, alone, he says, our castle will laugh a siege to scorn. He knows they can hole up in the castle. They can come for him. It doesn't matter. He's willing to fight all on his own. And then there's the famous scene while he's sitting there um, and he hears a, a cry. And he says, Waff all what's that noise? And uh, they say, uh, they'll go, go check on it. Wherefore, by the way, um, in Shakespeare, wherefore means why. Um, so uh, I recently talked about this. Um, when he, when in Romeo and Juliet, Juliet says, um, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Um, therefore be but sworn my love, I'll no longer be a Capulet. What she's saying is, she's not saying, where are you, Romeo? Because they just met, right? What she's saying is, why? She said, no, Montague, why can't you be Tom Smith, right? If you're Romeo Montague, I can't fall in love with you. It's condemned, right? Our families are going to hate us. Why can't you be anything else? And if you be anything else, I'll give away my name. I'll no longer be Juliet Capulet, right? So in this scene, Macbeth says, he says, wherefore was that cry? And then they come back and they say, the queen, my Lord, is dead. And his response is the, the famous um, soliloquy. A soliloquy is where a character, uh, it's a form of monologue. It's, a, it's where a character is alone on stage and the audience can hear, can hear the character. And he says, I'll just do the whole thing. He says, um, he says um, she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon his, the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So in other words, he's saying, why couldn't I get this news later? Right? Um, but even if I did, life is, it's a poor player. It's like an actor wandering around on stage just talking. It's, it's where we kind of, you know, one could say that a lot of life is is spent like this, right? Where we're just kind of like uh, talking out into, into the psychosphere, right? We're talking out in the psychosphere. We're like just talking out into the wilderness. A lot of the things we do are, you know, may seem to many people to be sort of self-reflexive or purposeless if you have no purpose in your life, right? And he says at the end, um, and he says the sound and the fury, which is where Faulkner gets the title of his novel, um, signifying nothing. Now, would you say that Macbeth is has become completely nihilistic? Um, yeah, I would say so. Um, and that's because of his um, his spiritual um, his his spiritual deadness, his spiritual. De I mean, he not only look. I mean, I, actually, I don't know. I don't think he's spiritually dead. I mean, he he actually sold himself over, right, to the dark side. Um, so I would say that now he's at a point where, in a Crowleyan sense, it's like he, he's saying nothing matters. And which is interesting because it's like, okay, well, your wife just killed herself, right? She killed herself. She uh, In the film, she, def she defenestrated herself, right? She jumped out the window. And he, there's a scene where he looks down, he looks at her, he looks up, and then he looks up. And it's like, we're shown, there she is, she's dead, no emotion. There she is, there's where she came from. She came from the window. And what does he do? He he has his armor on, and he says, I'm going to fight to the last. He has no purpose. He, he, he's like, he says, blood will have blood, right? Um. And he's willing to fight to the end. And he's because there's, he has no other, what, what, I guess, what else is he going to do? What this guy, um, they come and invade. Um, and my favorite line in the whole play, um, he, he kills a bunch of guys and he says, I bear a charmed life. 
right? He leads a charmed life. And he does lead a charmed life, uh, but in the double sense. Uh, Macbeth uses those words earlier. Um, sp speak to us in the double sense. Um, which is that, yes, he's lived without being hurt. He's gotten all that he wanted. He got all this power, but he did it through a charm, right? He did it through a ritual. He did it through a demonic occult ritual with a coven. He drank their potion, right? He drank their blood. Um, he sold himself. And immediately after saying this is when McDuff, when McDuff says, despair thee of thy charm. He fights. Uh, this is a great scene in the film because it's clunky. Like they're both wearing medieval armor and it's like clunky. They fight with like the swords are like, it's not, it's not, I mean, it's choreographed, but it's not like sleek and shiny. It's like very true to life. They can't move because they're armor and they're like, one point, McDuff loses his sword. Then he fights with like a log. He hits Macbeth with a log. And then all of a sudden, bam, Macbeth gets sliced up through the neck. He's dead. The music goes. McDuff crawls up the stairs, chops off his head. The crown falls. Uh, a guy comes, picks up the crown, wipes it off, puts it on the head of Malcolm, who's now the king. Um, and then they... There's a, a gruesome scene where they stick a pike uh, into the head of Macbeth. Um, they wave it around. All the people are spitting on it. They put it in the ground. It's up there, decapitated head, waving. Uh, and then um, it's sort of darkness, that low droning sound again, and it's over. Um, and so that's it. That's the play. That's the film. And... Um, Again, you know, this is so unusual, like for a, it's so unusual for a Hollywood film um, because it's so dark. It's so dark, but it's like deceptively dark. I mean, you really have to see this and, and think about it. I mean, again, the thing with Shakespeare and Shakespeare in language is like, um, you don't have to, um, you don't have to like be a Shakespearean scholar to watch this and to, to understand it. You just you have to as long as you get a general sense of the language and what's happening is pretty clear. Um, I think that the play is so relevant for so many reasons. Um, I mean, <laughs> what this is February twenty second. I'm you know it's not like there's anything going on in the world right now. So so we we all know that power politics and um, and uh, and the language of the powerful is so. Um, all pervasive right now. I think that this, this, this play really gets to it better than um, anything. Um, and it's, you know, 500 years old, but it explains everything that's happening in the world right now. So that's it. That's all I got you guys. Um, any questions? What do you guys, what do you guys think? Shout out to shout out to, okay. Shout out to Jerry. Shout out to Jeff, my homeboy. Shout out to ADH. Nate, I see you. What's up, y'all? Um, thank you, guys. Thank you so much um, for coming. I appreciate it, and um, thanks for being um, thanks for being patient with um, the, the tech and everything. This was fun. This was cool. You guys got any questions? What do you think? What do you think about Polanski? What do you think about Roman Polanski? Hey yo, hey yo, Polanski. Polanski, you want to make a film, buddy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to make a film. That's not Polanski. That's, but that's how I imagine people talking to him. Hey, yo, Roman. Why can't you make a film like your brother Tony? He's always out there. He's doing stuff. You know, you, you always got to be in here. Uh, you know, Ma, you're making Ma lose her mind in here. What about Joey? I'm going to do what I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, you guys. Yeah, he's got the gabagool. He's got the gabagool. You know, you know he's Polish and he lives in Switzerland. And he's five foot two or whatever. You know. <laughs> okay, you guys, that's about all I got. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, I love you. Peace out. And I'll see you guys soon. Shout out to everybody.
Peace, you guys.